like a week ago, well, maybe it was a week and a half ago, I just kept like getting this message in my head, and I was like, no, God. <laughs> I already did that, remember? <laughs> and, uh, but it just wouldn't go away, and like I would wake up, and I would have all these words and these verses and all this stuff, and I was like, remember when I said, no, God, <laughs> no, we already did this. And so it wouldn't go away. So last week I told Claudia, I said, well, I think God gave me a message for next week. <laughs> So she said, well, I'll pray about it and get back to you. I was like, what? <laughs> you think I'm ever going to offer again? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so God gave me this message. And then let me tell you, you know when God tells you to do something, when he gives you a mission, when he gives you an assi- assignment, doesn't Satan just want to do anything to stop that from happening? So Satan had just been coming against our family. I was talking to <laughs> Gail yesterday. I had three kids home with the flu, and it just was ugly at my house. <laughs> So Gail prayed over me. Actually, she smacked me upside the head in the name of Jesus. So I didn't get the flu, but I had a headache all day. (laughs) Um, So let's pray. God, I just thank you. I thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that you are faithful and true. I thank you that you are here in our midst. And God, I just pray that you open our hearts and our minds to the word that you have for us today. God, I thank you that you speak to all of us in your word in a general sense, but God, that you have a special, specific word for each one of us. God, that you know us so well, so individually, that you love us so personally, that you have a specific word for us today, a specific way to minister to us, a truth that you want to speak into our situations. And God, I pray that you just bind everything that may distract us from hearing you. God, I pray that the meditations of my heart and that my words are pleasing to you, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, which we looked at last week, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Um, Gail talked to us about trust last week and defining it as to having faith, complete assurance, to rely on without being able to see or to prove at times. And as we look at David's life, there were times where he was trusting in the Lord without a doubt, with full assurance, but that's not where he is right now. And as we looked at David uh, last week, we were in 1 Samuel chapter 21, we watched as he took his eyes off of the Lord and... um, He was looking at his circumstances, and out of fear, he ran. He fled, and he fled to Nob, and we saw the consequences of his disobedience. We saw that he, we saw that the priests um, ended up getting murdered. We did see eventually that he took responsibility for his actions, but this week, we're not quite there. We're going to be in the middle of this section, so we are going to take up um, 1 Samuel 21, and we're going to start... in verse 10. So David has fled to Nob, and then now he's fleeing again. Verse 10 says, Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances and saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? When I read that... I thought, who is this guy? Who is he? Where is um, the sacrificial shepherd who was on a daily basis laying down his life for the sheep that were entrusted to his care, not only leading them into green pastures and to fresh water, but defending them against the lion and the bear? Where, where's that David? Where is the worshiper of God who played the harp and wrote and sang words of praise and hymn to our Lord, who sang of his majesty, of his greatness, of his might, of his power, of his faithfulness. Where is that guy? 
Where's the confident warrior that went to battle against Goliath with just five smooth stones, but in the name of the living God? Where is the anointed one, God's chosen one, the future king of Israel? Where's my hero, David? Who is this guy? And yet, isn't that the case with all of those that we put up on a pedestal to be our heroes? Like the actor we watch on television each week who plays a godly, moral role, a good example for our children until we look into his personal life and we're disgusted and repulsed by what we see. Or even the Christian music artist who writes words of praise and, and leads us in worship. And then we read that they are getting a divorce or they've checked themselves into a rehab center. Or the athletes who sport a giant cross on their shoulder and thank the Lord for every victory, who are caught in an illicit affair or using steroids. They all let us down. Eventually, all those humans that we put up um, as our heroes, that we put up on a pedestal, will fall short, will let us down. Romans 3.10 says, none is righteous, not one. So they can't live up to those standards. The only one that will never fail us, that will always live up to our expectations and then beyond is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He needs to be the hero of our lives. But as we look at David, he has failed to remember who God is the creator of the heavens and earth, the one that he witnessed as he was out shepherding the sheep, the one that he sang to. He's failed to remember who God is. He's failed to remember who he is, who he is in God, that he is the anointed one, that he has been chosen to be the king of Israel. He has failed to remember all the things that God has already brought him through. He has taken his eyes off of the Lord, and he's focusing on the circumstances, and he is allowing fear to guide his path. He is not trusting in the Lord with all his heart. He is allowing fear to guide his path. And yet, how many times have we done the same? How many times have we looked at the path we're on and allowed fear to guide us there instead of trusting in the Lord? Or how many times have we allowed self-condemnation to lead our paths? We've screwed up so many times. We've sinned so badly that we don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve to come to the Lord. We don't deserve his help. We don't deserve the path, the goodness that he desires for us. So we allow self-condemnation to lead our, to direct, direct our paths or pride. How many times do we think, we've got this, God. <laughs> you go on with the big stuff, the disasters all over the world. I can take care of these little things. And we allow pride to direct our paths. I was 25, and um, I was given a, a big promotion at my, at my work, and it was one with a lot of responsibility. And uh, let me tell you that their desperation to fill that position far outweighed <laughs> my abilities. And I knew that, and they let me know that on a regular basis. <laughs> but you know what? I knew that God had put me in that position. I knew that God had a plan and a purpose for me in that position, that he wanted to use me in that position. And so I wanted to do the best that I could. I did not want to let him down. And so I went back to school at night. So I learned at night what I needed to be doing during the day. And I would apply it the next day. Um, I also surrounded myself with mentors, with people who had experience in education in the field, who could advise me when I needed their help. And I did not do one thing without seeking the Lord. I knew that he had a plan for me. I knew that the decisions that I was making was affecting the lives of people, and I did not want to make a false step. And so I prayed about everything, everything I did, everything I said, every plan set into motion. I was on my face before the Lord because I knew I needed to honor him because he had placed me in that position. Well, he blessed me, and he blessed that position. I was growing personally, learning to trust on the Lord, in the Lord in all circumstances. But, but the business was growing as well. And so several years later, I was offered another position um, and another business on a much larger scale. I was given the opportunity to build from the ground up. The only difference was this time I had a little education behind me. And this time I had some experience. I had made a name for myself in this business, and I didn't feel like I needed to surround myself with mentors. I felt like I was at the position that I should be the mentor. I was 
painfully unaware of my inadequacies this time, and I didn't seek the Lord in everything that I did. I got this, God. You go ahead and take care of the disasters in the world. And so, um, and yet his hand was still on me in his hand. He desired to bless this ministry, and it was so successful that even before we had finished building, we had to expand. But I was the one out front making the decisions. I was the one putting the plans into place. I was receiving all the attention, and I was receiving all the glory, and I was not passing it on to the Lord. And he allowed me to stay in that position. He allowed that business to be successful. I was in the position of the decisions that I was making were affecting thousands of people. And yet I thought, I have this, Lord. I can do this on my own. And he allowed me to continue in that position successfully. The business grew and grew for a couple of years. And then he said, you know what? <laughs> you need to come out of there. Because he wasn't receiving any of the glory. He gave me chances time and time again to point people to him. And I didn't. I failed to do that. And it wasn't until he pulled me out, until I took several steps back, that I saw how prideful and arrogant I had become how far I had strayed from trusting in him, from leaning on him in all of my situations, in all things. And he had to pull me out to show me that. We're going to look at a gentleman in the New Testament who allowed pride to lead his path as well. We're going to look at Luke 15, um, verse 11, the prodigal son. And the, the young man in this story, is the, um, he's the youngest son of a wealthy landowner, and he decided for whatever reason that he was tired of life on the farm. He wanted to um, go to the big city. He wanted to be out on his own. He wanted to try things his way. So he went to his father and demanded what eventually would have been rightfully his, but he wanted it now, and he wanted it his way. And so his father gave him his inheritance. And so the f foolish, young, immature, man went off to a foreign land and he blew it all. He spent everything that his father had worked his whole life for. He blew it all and then he found himself in need of a job. So we're going to pick up this story. Um, Luke chapter 15 verse 15. So speaking of the prodigal son, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him who sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one, no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and yet I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your servant. Make me one of your hired... I am no longer, sorry, worthy to be called one of your sons. Make me one of your hired servants. So it says that he woke up, he came to himself, he woke up to his circumstances. He was in his right mind, one of the versions I read. Um, he's a young Jewish boy and he has been taught all his life that the pigs are unclean. He is not to, let alone eat, he's but not to associate eat the pig and yet his job is to go out and take care of the swine and to feed them. And he is in such desperate is such a desperate state that he is longing to eat the pig slop that he is feeding the pigs. He is so hungry because he has absolutely nothing. He has wasted it all. And he doesn't just wake up to himself, wake up to the situation and say, man, I've made a mess of things. I really screwed this up this time. He realizes that, but in addition, he realized that he has sinned against his father. And he doesn't stay there. He turns away. He realizes that he has to go back. He has to make it right. And just like Pastor Derek talked about this weekend, when we realize we have sin, we don't turn 100 degrees or 150 degrees. We turn 180 degrees. We turn completely away from that sin and go back to our Father. We confess our sin and we go back towards our Father. So let's continue in um, verse 20. And so again, speaking of the prodigal son, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
bring a ring and put it on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be married. It's easy to see the failures of the prodigal son. It's easy to see how David is failing and falling short. But so often it's hard to see our own sin, this own areas that we are falling short. Because maybe they're not written down for all of history to go over, to repeat. Maybe they aren't out in public for everyone to see. And yet still, we've, we sin against God. Still we fall short. When we don't trust in the Lord with all of our heart, we are failing. We are, we are sinning against the Lord. When we place ourselves as Holy Spirit in our husbands' lives, quick to point out where they are falling short, where they need work, a little work from the Lord. <laughs> We're not trusting on the Lord to do that. When we worry and stress about where's the money coming from to pay the bills this month, we're not trusting in the Lord. When instead of waiting for the man that God has prepared in advance for us, we go out with the first man who asks, we're not trusting in the Lord. When we make excuses for our children, when we bail them out of their consequences, we're not trusting in the Lord. We don't acknowledge him in all that we do when we steal his glory. When we disobey the promptings of the Holy Spirit, maybe to teach in front of you all. <laughs> when we disobey the prompting of the Holy Spirit to give a word of encouragement to a friend, to speak a hard truth into someone's life, or even just to stop and smile and say hello. We fail the Lord whenever we don't turn people towards Jesus, whenever we don't put ourselves aside and point others towards our Lord and Savior, we sin against him. Sometimes we're so busy looking at the shortcomings of others that we fail to see our own sin, and yet God wants to wake us up to the path that we're on, and he doesn't want us just to see what a mess we've made of things, but we want, he wants us to see that we have sinned against him and him alone in any area of our lives that we are not fully giving to him, any areas of our lives, our lives that we are not allowing him to be Lord. He wants to wake us up to that. He wants to show us that and point us back to him. And just like the father and the story, he is waiting for us. He is not, he's not angry. He's not a distant God, but he is waiting with our outstretched arms. And he's not waiting to embrace us so that he can throw our failures back in our faces. He doesn't accept us conditionally. We don't have to go through a probationary period to see if we're going to measure up this time. He embraces us fully. He accepts us fully. He restores us completely as his daughters, just like the father in the story. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not a, not a little bit, but all. He cleanses us from all. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you know, so often we stop there, but that's not the end of the sentence. That's the end of verse 23, but there's a comma. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We have been redeemed. We don't have to stay in verse 23 any longer. We don't have to stay in our sin. We have been redeemed. When we, we receive a gift card that's been purchased and paid for by someone else, but with our name on it, all we do, it doesn't cost us anything. We just go to the store and we redeem that gift, gift card and we just receive the gift. The gift of forgiveness has already been paid for, the most costly gift that God has ever given. And it doesn't cost us anything. Even if we had enough money to pay for it, we couldn't. We could never pay for it. We can't earn it. Nothing we can do will, will make us deserving of the gift of forgiveness that God has given us. We just have to receive it. 
And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time receiving gifts that I don't feel like I'm deserving of. Unless it's my birthday or Christmas, I have a hard time receiving gifts, especially when I know I don't deserve that gift. But you know, it's humbling. It's humbling to receive. And forgiveness just goes one way. God is giving it to us. We have done nothing to deserve it. We aren't even worthy of it, except that God has decided that we are worthy to receive that gift. And all we have to do is receive it. And, and David realized that, realized that he had fallen short, that he had sinned against God. And after he makes a fool of himself, and, and the Lord, really, because whenever we speak, if we're children of God, whenever we speak, whatever we do, we are representing the Lord. Um, he wrote Psalm 34, which we're not going to read before you turn there. <laughs> You're going to do that in your homework. Um, but he wrote Psalm 34 and um, confessed his sin. But again, since we're going to do that in, in our homework, I'm going to have you sir, turn to Psalm 51, which is what he wrote after he messed up again, um, sinning against Bathsheba. Psalm 51 reads, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. A broken and contrite heart. If we come to God with a broken and contrite heart, without pride, without the excuses, without blaming our circumstances, our choices on our circumstances or on others, when we realize that not only have we made a mess of things, but that we have sinned against God and God alone, when we come to him, he offers forgiveness, he offers mercy. David realizes that, he realizes that he's, he says that he sinned against God and God alone, and yet knowing the character of God. He knew God, and he came to him in verse 1, I have mercy on me, O God. He pleads with God for his mercy. He knows that others may have been affected by his sin, but it was really the creator of heaven and earth that he had sinned against. It's really the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, that he had offended and that he deserved death. And yet, he knew the character of God and pled for God's mercy. He humbly comes before God, pleading for God to not give him what he deserves, but to give him instead his God's grace. David's pleading with the Lord because he knows the Lord. You know, as we look at David's life, he seems to screw up a lot. <laughs> but he's still called a man after God's own heart. And yet, why is that? As we look at his life, when he's successful, he, give God, he gives God the glory. He praises God and points people to God. And when he sins, when he falls short, he doesn't stay there. He gets up and he turns 180 degrees. And he humbly comes before the Lord, pleading for his mercy. 
Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. And David knew that. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We don't need to stay in our sin. We need to realize our sin, and we need to realize whom we have sinned against. And again, we need to get up and turn around and go back towards the Lord. And this is the example that we need to take from David's life. When we wake up in the morning and we're sick of ourselves, we're sick of our stuff, we're sick of the same sin that we get stuck in over and over. We're sick of spinning our wheels, of going around the mountain one more time. And you know, we're in good company because it seems like everybody in here fails. <laughs> Adam failed, Noah failed, Abraham failed, Moses failed, Samson failed. Peter's known for his failures. And Paul, one of the greatest missionaries ever in Romans says, why do I do the things I don't wanna do? So we're not alone, but you know, God wants, doesn't want us to stay there. He doesn't want us, us to stay in that cycle of sin. He does not want us to stay under bondage. Jesus came to give us life, and not just life. He came to give us abundant life. And abundant life doesn't happen when we are stuck in the cycle of sin. On that cross, Jesus defeated sin and darkness in our lives. The power of the cross breaks the bondage of sin and God doesn't want us to stay there we no longer have to have to live under that bondage we have if we have the Holy Spirit living within us we have the same power living within us today that raised Jesus from the dead and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus we don't need to stay there we have fallen short we have failed over and over again just like David and yet we can choose today we can choose today to access the power of the Holy Spirit that is with, living within us. We can choose to defeat the enemy, to defeat the sin by accessing the Holy Spirit, by relying on the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 1 John 4.4 4 says, He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time, God knew that we were going to fall short. God knew that we were going to allow pride and fear to direct our paths and that we would stray away from him. And yet, before the beginning of time, God made a plan for us that through the sacrificial blood of Jesus, that we would be able to receive his grace before the beginning of time. He planned for that. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound in you. David knew the character of God. He knew that God's mercies were new every morning. He knew that if God forgave him, he would be made white as snow. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Let that be the cry of our hearts today. You know, as I was going through this study, I think this study was actually for me. <laughs> you guys just get to listen in on it. But, you know, God was showing me the areas that I am not 100% fully committed to him, the areas of my heart, just those hidden places that I'm like, you can have all this, but ooh, leave this alone, God. This I'm just holding tightly to. And he doesn't want that. He wants it all. He can heal that hidden place, that hurt place, if I'll just give it to him. He wants us to trust in him in all the areas of our lives, in every area, because he wants to he wants to restore those broken areas, those hurt places. If today, if God has shown you any area of your life that you're just holding on to, that you're not willing to give him, any area that you are not trusting in him, that you are leaning on your own understanding instead of God, um, we're gonna, I'm going to end in a minute after we close in prayer, and I want you just to spend some time just right where you are, but alone with God. I want you just to... 
just like David did, just like the prodigal son did. Confess that sin. Confess that sin before the Lord. Acknowledge that you have sinned, that we have sinned against him and him alone. And then cry out to the Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He wants us to be. He wants to restore us. He wants to completely embrace us and restore us back to our position as his daughters, as heirs to the throne with Christ Jesus. But we need to take that first step. And again, he's waiting with open arms, outstretched, waiting to embrace us and restore us. Let's pray. God, I thank you today that your mercies are new each morning. God, I thank you that you allow the failures in our lives to draw us closer to you, to keep us humble, to keep us dependent upon you. God, I thank you that no matter how far away we have walked, no matter how far down the path of destruction we have gone, that we need just take one step back towards you and that you will receive us back with open arms. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for not giving us what we deserve. And I also thank you for just the grace that you give us, the overflowing grace that you pour upon us. God, I pray that you just purge us with hyssop and we will be made pure. Wash us whiter than snow. God, forgive us our sins, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. God, I thank you for these ladies. I thank you for your word that is faithful and true. I ask that you be with us now. God, stir within our hearts anything, any area that we have not fully committed to you. God, let us right now just lay it down before you. In the name of Jesus, amen.